you are going to forgive me because now is the first time that I think that I, I have to do the prayer. I have no, I'm not prepared. But I think that it is a wonderful thing in this time to thank God for the technology that make us able to be, to join together without um, limits of space or time because I have been in Zoom with people in other, all around the world at the same time. Someone from Australia, other from America. And I think that this is so wonderful. I wonder, um, today I bought flowers, edible flowers. And I couldn't resist, I never eat a flower. But I thought that it is, it is something so wonderful to celebrate the spring, the beautiful day. And this is like eating flowers, to be all with you. And, and I think um, we, we know Seamus before, and we were so impressed with him. And I think that we are going to enjoy very much and it would be like eating flowers at the end of the of the talk when when the spirit when they share the spirit that they have. So forgive me for not have um, a usual prayer, but I think that this is the spirit talking, and and uh, I just looking forward to to hear the thing and share this this time this marvelous time with you with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Nieves. Thank, Thank you very you. much. And now we pass over to Kay Mulhall, who will introduce our speakers for tonight. Kay. Okay. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm very happy to be introducing Seamus Ahern and Rita Fernandez, both of whom are special ministers in the parish of Rivermount. Now, if I know Seamus for a long time, and I know he's an innovator. He's a faith-filled man. He's a very people-driven man and he's very real and he looks at life really so he's he's devoted he's a, an Augustinian I have to say that he's an Augustinian and he's a, a very um, well-known Augustinian not just in Ireland but in the UK and throughout the world and also he is um, he's passionate about church and people um, and he has a wonderful, wonderful companion in Rita Fernandez. I enjoyed my talk with Rita because um, she told me that she's longer in Rivermount than you are, Seamus. And she was three years, I think, before you arrived. But anyhow, uh, that leaves a little bit of an edge, I think, on her. But um, she um, is full of the spirit, full of the spirit. And I was delighted also when I knew that her name was Fernandez, I said she must have some Spanish connection. So we had a little talk in Spanish as well. But <laughs> I found uh, my speaking with her for the very first time to be just delightful. She's a delightful woman. So I'm looking forward to seeing you in the person on, on Zoom tonight and looking forward to what you're going to share with us, your, your pastoral ministry in Rivermount. Wonderful. So over to you. I think Rita's going first. Yep. Uh, Seamus, <laughs> gentleman, he is. And, uh, you know, and Seamus and Rita, very welcome. Okay. Can everybody hear me? Thank you, Kay. Thank you so That's much. Rita. Can everybody hear? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, <clears throat> as Kay just said, I have been living here in Rivermount since 1975. And the church hadn't even been built then. Eventually, it was built. Our first parish priest was Father Forrestal. And we had diocesan priests for about 10 years. And in about, I think it was 1988, we got our Augustinians. And they were a wind of change from our first parish priest that came, Father Fogarty, who recently passed. Uh, he walked in the door. And I swear he had a little black book because he immediately got everybody a job. And it didn't matter if you 
objected or said you couldn't do it. He said, yes, you can and you will. And, you know, he instilled faith in us that we didn't have in ourselves. So the building started from there. And we also had wonderful uh, Brigidine sisters. Sister Savio had been there before the Augustinians. And then Sister Eileen Deegan came. And these women worked along with, mostly with the women. Now we were all newlyweds here with children. Few of us worked outside the home, bit of a loose end. And these women molded us into groups, different courses. Now it wasn't just about knitting and sewing. We did Briggs Myers courses, a little bit of self-development and everything. And that made such a change because coming from a background where women were just at home in the house with really no power or anything else, this was a whole new ball game for us. And a lot of those women that were involved in those courses are still involved today in the church, funny enough. Um, so we, our church now, our parish is divided. It's a long, narrow parish. So I am at the end of St. Oliver Plunkett's and the other end is St. Finian's. And we have a little oratory down there. So the people who live nearest to the oratory go to services there and the people who live down near St. Oliver's come here. So we're like two parishes in one. And we also have three primary schools. We have St. Finian's up the end and we have St. Oliver Plunkett's and St. Malachy's down this end. So obviously then we have a connection with um, communion and confirmation. We would also be involved in that. So about uh, 16 years ago, I'm going to speak to you first about the team and then I will speak to you a little bit afterwards about formation and how formation happens in the parish. Because I think if you want to build a team, you first have to have formation. It doesn't just happen organically. People have to have a certain amount of training behind them. So um, 16 years ago, I was invited to join the team and I turned James down because I, the way it was described to me, I felt I was going to have too much impact on James's personal life. I realize now that's not the way it is. But I felt, well, you know, I have my home life. I do what I want in my own house. And the church and the priest's house are very closely combined. There's a lot of meetings going there. And I, I felt it was a little bit of an infringement on privacy. So I left it there and I served on the parish pastoral council for a long time. I was chairperson for a long time. And I, I cut my teeth there, you might as well say. So eventually a vacancy came up on the parish team and I was invited to go along. And I've never regretted it, to be honest with you. So our parish team consists of four religious, three uh, Augustinian friars, and one parish sister, Sister Liz. She's a Salesian sister and another wonderful woman. I can't speak highly enough about her. And then we have five lay women. Now, we only have five lay women because a recent male dropped, had to drop out. People, you know, things come up in their lives or you know, their circumstances change and, and they can step down. And when we need a new person to come on the team, it's put to the group. You know, as somebody has suggested, it goes by the group and it's a joint decision about who comes on. And it only so happens that the five women were the five best people for the job. Had there been five better men, they'd have been on too. We're not selective in male or female. It's always who is best for the job. Um, the role of the parish team is quite similar to the parish pastoral council, except that we meet weekly and the council meets monthly. So obviously a month to month is not going to keep the parish going. You need that weekly meeting. Now, we set up an agenda. Well, we set up a calendar in July. That calendar will have all the holidays and saints days and high holidays. It's, that's all marked out. Easter. Um, Pentecost, everything is marked out on a calendar. And then we go through that month by month and we decide what else is going to go in. Could be Valentine's Day, could be Mother's Day, Father's Day, Grandparents' Day, Harvest Time, all of those celebratory things that we celebrate throughout the year. One of our big days, our biggest day in fact, is the 2nd of November, when we remember our dead. And that is an absolute massive celebration. 
and it's the only time when we have standing room only in the church. Now, if you were to come to one of our meetings, you would find that we have a rotating chair, a rotating secretary, and a rotating prayer person. Uh, prayer to us now is quite a lengthy thing. Uh, we set up a sacred space. The prayer person will pick something. It could be something to do with the day, with the season, with the month. It could be a reading from the Bible. It could be something from the readings of the day. And that will be read out. We sometimes we share the reading around. Everyone will get an opportunity to read. Then we will have silence, a little bit of reflection, where you can just sit there and be with your own thoughts. And if you would like to share, that's your time for sharing then. And we're all very comfortable to share pretty personal stuff about ourselves, such as the trust that's on, because, you know, confidentiality is a huge thing, very much to fore, and always respect it. And the sharing is always very valuable. It's what binds us together. Then we go back to our prayer and we leave a final prayer then for the end when we wind up our meeting. Now, what do we discuss on the agenda? Well, first of all, as I said, after our check-in and asking how people are, which is very important as well, you know, you don't know what situation people have come from and it just gives them a few minutes to draw breath. And... Um, we have our minutes, the minutes are done. They will be done by the secretary. The minutes are obviously an accurate account of the previous uh, week's uh, meeting. And we were looking at very good minute takers and they will be accepted and seconded and all that. So it's quite official in that respect. Um, then we have a review of the previous week's meeting. The, sorry, the previous week's happenings could be the weekend masses, anything and everything that has come up. It could be anything. It could be something to do with a leaky roof. It could be to do with, you know, was there something, did somebody have a concern? Was somebody stopped in the street by one of the parishioners with, with their concern that they wanted voiced at the meeting? It could be anything coming off of the previous week's occurrences. And then we look at the week ahead. We look at the masses that are coming up. We look at what's to be celebrated. We could be have something like say, a commissioning of pastoral council members, commissioning for readers, commissioning for Eucharistic ministers. These things happen on a yearly basis because we, we would have a change of personnel. And it's always lovely for the congregation to see these people in that role where more or less, they are getting a special blessing to go forward and to do this job that they volunteer to do or have been chosen to do. Um, we speak about, as I said, maybe we could be planning Mother's Day or Father's Day or the Harvest Festival. And we'll also decide who's going to be involved in doing things. You know, now, um, we are very lucky that two of our members on our parish team are also on the pastoral council as are the three uh, friars and the religious sister so in all those six people of the team are on the council and we also give the minutes of the meeting to the chairperson of the parish pastoral council for continuity and so that it, we're not seen as a little secret society or anything like that because it's very open and that works very well um, the team runs throughout the year. We take a break in the summer, but we do have a, a loose kind of how are you doing meeting in case there's anything of urgency that needs attention to. But we don't have the very uh, strict meeting that we would have with the long prayer and all of that. And then we come to um, we do for sorry we come to items. We have a bulletin every week, and the bulletin. Anybody can have an input into the bulletin. It's a bulletin that's it's given out at masses. People take it, they come into mass, they take their bulletin. It's not like the bulletin I've seen in other churches that gives the uh, readings for the day. This is more like a newsletter. It's a newsy bulletin. Okay, the, you know, different uh, friars have different approaches to it. 
Seamus is it's actually the favourite because it's always really newsy and full of gossip. And other people take other, you know, might have something about the readings in it as well. But I always notice there's a grab for Seamus's bulletin because people want to see where they feature in it. And it's never complimentary, let me just say that. And um, then we come to uh, any other business and we um, have the, an appointment at time for the following meeting. It's, the meeting is every Wednesday, straight, uh, straight after mass. So that's how we run our team. Now, I don't know so far, does anybody have any questions on that? Or would Seamus like to say something? Seamus? I come in a little later. Uh, okay. Richard, okay. just to say, I want to say, I just saw there that, that um, Anne Darcy is on, is on, on is looking in there, isn't she? Well, I seen Anne Darcy's face and then the gentleman called her some other name and I thought, God, she's the image of Anne Darcy. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we yeah. I've been inviting Andrash to say a few words a little later. A wonderful lady. Okay, right. wonderful good, good. lady. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Just just a few words on the point that you're making, then I'll talk more generally later. Okay. The council, what, what do we call it? The team is the essential uh, guiding, driving force in the parish, really. Because everything is discussed and everything is shared and everything is decided together. Isn't that the point? Mm? Yes, it is. Yes, and yes. It, it's remarkable. I have to say that for myself, really, that it, I find it remarkable that uh, it's, I'm not fond of meetings, but they are they proliferate, really. But we enjoy, and I think that's central to the parish, is the banter of life that matters. There, there's an excitement and a laughter and a fun in all the life of the parish, and it's. It's exemplified in the on the team, isn't it? Mm? And to me, the heart of what we do in the parish is that mm. banter, that hilarity, that madness, that fun, that enjoyment of each other. That's enough for me at the moment. But I'm going to oh. come back to Anne, and then I'll do a general comment. All right? Mm? Mm. You want to go back to Anne? Do you want to go to Anne, Seamus? Can't hear you. Anne Darcy, where are you? She hasn't disappeared, has she? No, I'm here, Seamus. Can, can you hear me? I can introduce Anne first. Anne is the chairperson of our parish council. I am. She's, Hello, how are you? She's an outstanding lady, and I love dumping her in the middle of problems, right? <laughs> and this, you're definitely dumping me now because I really only joined because I wanted to listen in and hear how everything was going. I wasn't expecting to be talking here tonight, so, and I'm only in the door about 15 minutes, so. That's, that's why you weren't invited in the first place. She works out in, in, in Beaumont, right? Uh, and she has been brilliant because uh, the honesty so of that woman, she, she's full of heart. Uh, and the whole COVID-19 almost destroyed her because going into work and not be able to do anything, afraid of catching something, afraid of not being there enough for the people who were sick and dying, almost broke you, didn't it, Anne? Mm. Now, say a word about the parish as you see it. It did, it did, I must say. Mm. So I suppose I'm newer than uh, Rita in the parish. I'm only about 28 years here in the parish. <laughs> But I, I'm a very shy person, and I was asked, you know, some years back by Sister Eileen Deegan, that Rita referenced there earlier, one of the Brigidine sisters, who was a very active lady in the parish, and asked me to help out with a baptism team. Now, she asked me, could I help on the following Saturday? And I thought it was a once-off, and I said, no problem. But I've been doing it ever since, because it's a lovely ministry, and I love working, you know, with the families preparing for the baptisms, and on the day of the baptism, it's just a joy to see the new life, the new life both for the family, and the whole new life in coming into the faith community, and been feeling a part of that. But as regards Riverman to the parish, it is to me a big family affair. We're all the one family, and as I say, I was very shy. The guiding teachers and our shepherds like Seamus and everybody else has been there a long time. Time, are very good at pushing us that have very little confidence in ourselves to improve by going to the likes of the pathway courses down in Clonliff, you know, um, encouraging us to get up and speak when we feel we don't have the confidence for it. And it's really, 
I suppose when I joined Pathways, I felt I had a good fate to be brought up, but I learned I didn't know nothing. It was all rote learning as a school, like everybody else did. And I really did not know how to understand the messages from the Bible or anything until I went to Pathways. And then I was told there, just start listening to the word and then you'll hear it. So it has changed me enormously. It's changed my own personal faith journey. And as Seamus said, it's yes, in all the meetings, it's the sharing, it's that respect for everybody's viewpoint and everybody is a gift within the parish, whatever their gift, their role is, whether it's planting the flowers outside the church, whether it's doing the painting, the repairs, everybody's gift and contribution is so appreciative, you know, and as I say, it's like one big family, if something goes wrong, everybody's there to help out. And I think that's the best way that we can celebrate our Eucharist and going forward, I think it's definitely a pattern that should be adapted all over where we're not going to the church on Sunday morning and being preached at. We're actually a part of it because I think that's one big thing I find, especially since COVID with the online masses and everything, the masses we have here, everybody's a part of it. You know, people are after the uh, readings, people are asked what did they get from those readings, if they had a word to share or anything like that. And it's, to me, that's learning again, because people will share, but then they will bring it back and explain it more to us, which I feel I feel I'm at Sunday school every Sunday I go because, as I say, my knowledge on the Bible uh, and I love to hear the stories of the time, the culture at the time, which, you know, we didn't know or understand about. We were taking it all too liberal. Um, and so I think that is the huge enrichness of meeting on a Sunday morning and celebrating because we're all in it together it's not just one man up there you know talking down to us we're all contributing and being a part of it and it's the most enriching mass i think anyone could go to um but yeah the team everybody does a terrific job as i say and everybody's there for everybody else um it's a lively community and our social gatherings are i love them you know we've so many people there and we've great singers and musicians and that is as much a part of the parish as our Sunday services or any other services we celebrate. It's the social gatherings are hugely enriching. It's getting to know the families. Um, and like I say, being a part of the baptism team, I love it. You, you know, meet families and young parents afterwards and it continues on, it spreads out. Um, I would do some work in the GA club and you know, you see these babies growing up then and it's just lovely. It's got that continuity going on and everybody, as I say, it's. It's a new way, I think, of sharing our faith and enriching our own faith. I don't think I have anything else to say. I was caught on the hop. I, I wasn't expecting to be talking here. <laughs> I, really, I really come because I wanted to kind of, you know, just be supportive more than anything, just in the background. And but, um, as I say, we have a great, uh, we have great people, great shepherds here. You always speak with Pardon? heart and with sincerity. And you're always there and do too much. We all know that. And thank you so much. Uh, Rita? No problem. I just want to say one more thing about this. Um, Anne and I have travelled around to a lot of places together and met with an awful lot of people. And when we realise the freedom we have in our parish, we're just gobsmacked, to be honest with you, because we meet with people in whose parishes the parish priest does everything, says everything, commands everything and they are just blown away by the freedom we have in our parish and the trust that's given to us and you know you won't get that anywhere I don't know any other parish that, ha that has it and I mean why not trust us we are trustworthy people everybody is but we have been given this we have been empowered to do it with the formation that we've experienced in Pathways I'll tell you a bit about that in a minute with Kieran O'Mahony Kieran comes and he gives us the school of the word. And most of our people, they would have had limited education because this was a very working class area, including myself. And, you know, our, our education in, in religious left finished when we were making our confirmation. And we didn't really explore it very much after then. We not an awful lot of us would have went to mass and we wouldn't have had a clue what was going on. And to see people come to Kieran's School of the Word 
and eat the words out of his mouth because he's treating them like adults and speaking to them like adults and explaining, talk about the road to a moss, breaking the, explaining the word to us. And people are saying, you can see them, yes, now I get it. Now I get it. Not telling fairy stories or once upon a time or, you know, huge miracles and all that I find very hard to believe in. Kieran, I asked Kieran, Kieran explained it to me perfectly well. It doesn't lessen my faith, it actually increases my faith. But anyway, just to say that in our parish, having a parish team with the parish council, the freedom extended to the laity is unbelievable. And I would recommend it to anybody. So if anybody would like to ask anything at this stage, or you want me to continue on about pathways and formation, and um, do you want to hear about that? <clears throat> yeah, I think it'd be nice, yes, if you told us a bit about pathways, and then I think Seamus wanted to say a bit more as well. Yeah. Okay, Seamus. Thank do you me. want to go first, Seamus? No, Rick, you continue. I, I'll come back in. Okay, right? so pathways is it's a an adult faith development program, and it's one night per week for two years, and it, it follows the school um calendar. So you know, you break for Easter, you break for Christmas, and you break for summer. There are no exams, no written work. Um, it costs 400 euro per year. We were all sponsored by our parish very generously and really appreciated that. There's a different, different topic every week. And um, we are formed into groups. On arrival, you're formed into your group and you stay with that group throughout the year. And you, go, you have a, a speaker, you listen to your speaker, you go for coffee, you come back, and then you sit and you speak, you listen, and you speak if you want to speak, you listen, you hear, and you tease out what you've heard. And by God, you know what? Your eyes opened. We learned so much. There are so many different uh, uh, topics. Um, there are, you learn about steps of faith, images of God, Introduction to scripture, celebrating the church a year, the person of Christ, a personal journey, sacraments, the moral life, spirituality. All of these over a two year period, broken down very simply. You don't need any degrees, you don't need any big exams because it's all done in very basic language that we can all understand. Now, I have seen people go to this course and go in like lambs and come out like lions. The difference in people at when they graduate, they are like, they come alive. You can see it in the man, can't you? They, they, their confidence is at a high. They come out, they're filled with light, filled with spirit. It's the most amazing transformation you'll ever see in a person. And it's so worthwhile. Now it's been held in Clonliffe, I think, uh, this, now, I'm not a spokesperson for Glenlivre or anything, but I just can't say the value that this course gave is immeasurable. And we have probably about 40 people in the parish at this stage that would have gone through that course. And this is another, it's like uh, the people you went to primary school with, you know, the way you always have that connection. There is a connection between the pathways people that have been there and done that. And it's, it's, it's a binder as well, you know. So um, yeah, we the second year deals with uh, visions and models of church, approach to ministry, bereavement and loss, family, pastoral issues today, justice and peace, ecumenism, ecology and caring for yourself. So you can see how wide this is and you can see how some the, the people who have done the course, um, for them to come onto the pastoral council or for them to come onto the team, they're very well prepared. I mean, one of the things I learned was actually to listen. And then, you know, listen to what's being said and then to feel brave enough to open up and speak about what you think because there is actually you know, no right or wrong because it's from your personal experience that you're speaking. So it's wonderful. So I think Pathways, I think Seamus will agree that Pathways has been a revelation. Am I right, James? Yes. Yeah. Um, no, Jeff, I want to pick up a few points from you there, there, Rita. Ooh. 
to me, the outstanding issue, the outstanding issue really is the question of confidence. Yeah. The other word you use, respect. I mean, I, I, I look at our parish uh, and we were a bit notorious for years with um, rob cars, with murder, with criminality. And uh, well, it really was bad <coughs> in many years here. And we're very simple folk here. I think you put it, uh, we wouldn't be deeply educated, right? But it's the honesty, it's the spontaneity, it's the banter, it's the directness, it's the um, openness of heart and mind as being the outstanding feature. And I think in regard to church, in regard to God, rather, let's not say church, it's our job as parish has been to, to almost to encourage people to believe in themselves, to respect their own experience of life and of God, just living life, right? So we didn't ever have to get too churchy. Uh, and, and I mean, I'd say, for example, just take a different version. Uh, the funerals in the parish are quite extraordinary. They're extraordinary, really. I mean, we would have so much involvement after the funeral. It'd be so personalised. But rather for us, it is the invitation into the heart of a person's life, into their story of life, and the honesty and just the, 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 um, the privilege and the beauty and the wonder of a person's life, and the way people take us in there is to me the most extraordinary thing ever. And I find the very same everywhere. What has happened in the church, it, it's how people have shared on scripture, how people share, share at church, how people respond to scripture, how people encourage each other. And it's the laughter of life, the whole lot of it, isn't it really? Uh, to me, that's the, the biggest thing ever. And to me, it's a privilege every day I live that I'm not bringing something, I'm receiving something. So we all receive communion from each other because the God of life touches everyone. We're touched and in touch and touched by the God who is living among us. Not in the kind of regularizing, uh, structured way, but in every aspect of life. And that many might be going to church, but we're all part of them and they're part of us as a community. Eh? It's a blessed place, really is. It's a blessed place. And uh, it's, I uh, repeat the word privilege just to be here with this community. But to see you, Anne, to see you, Anne, speechify. Hmm? Don't mind Risha, she'd speechify anyway, right? Right? But right. as you said, uh, uh, Anne, you were shy. And you've got so much inside in that lived life and in that heart. I mean, we just shudder when we see you and hear you because you're alive with God. And that is so true everywhere. And I think everywhere people believe in themselves now and nothing else matters if that is so. Mm -hmm. eh? that the, the God that can be found, the word made flesh happens in the life of every person. And I believe we respect that fully. Hmm? I do really. And uh, what do they call it? The sacraments. Well, the sacrament is every moment that we meet somebody, that we're in somebody's life, that we're touched by someone, we're touched by God in a person. That's it, really. Mm -hmm. Every single day, every day I'm involved in a funeral, for example, I come away and say, Oh my God. I do, really. Hmm? So do I have to look for mass? Do I have to look for prayer? Do I have to look for God? He's there. Hmm? In a very different way. Hmm? But there and flourishing. So um, that's enough really for me now. I want to just say just two little things to finish for me anyway. Um, Larry Forrester said to me back many years ago, he said, I should have stayed a parish priest. I should have stayed in Rivermount. And he meant it. He went to Ossery as bishop. Uh, Mick Cleary was here in the parish in Rivermount. <laughs> and uh, his way of living was rather different to others, right? <laughs> and he left many a story. 
But again, the attitude to Mick Cleary was interesting from the community. They remember the jokes he told. They remember the stories he told. They remember the fun he had with them. The other side of his life didn't matter too much, and it probably didn't. Hmm? Well, the funny thing, Seamus, was if people were dying, they like to send for Mick because they knew he lived a life and he'd understand. <laughs> <laughs> that was true, I think, too. Yeah, yeah. So my listen, my last word, it's enough words from me, really, is uh, I had a problem this afternoon. I was talking to Risha. And what she said to me was as follows. Did you get your hair cut or did you trim your beard? <laughs> right? I was talking to Liz afterwards, having a cup of tea, and Liz said, Change that shirt. You can't go on that uh, uh, on screen with that shirt. They don't match. And there was a book done about Thingless some years ago, and I featured in the book. And there was a powerful picture of myself in the book. Beautiful picture, really. And all some of the women could say was, why didn't you cut your eyebrows before they took the photograph? <laughs> That's my story. Thank you. Mm. OK. Mm. Right. Is, does anybody want to ask any questions before we move on? Rita, if we leave questions till the end. Okay, okay, right here. Well, then. I'm going to move on now a bit to what we had. It's called School of the Word. We have another Augustinian. You see, we're blessed. And Kieran or Mahani, I don't know if any of you have no Kieran. And we have run six week courses that Kieran has done. I think he's done about five or six or more. And he would come do his six weeks. And they were very well attended. As you know, he's a Pauline scholar. We've done <clears throat> courses on the Gospels, women in the Bible, the Psalms. And to watch these people come in and sit. Now, Kieran is wonderful <clears throat> because he doesn't only tell you about the Bible. He gives you a history lesson and a geography lesson. And it's almost like a, a holiday excursion because he's bringing you all around Turkey and all these lovely places. and. The way he speaks about St. Paul, you think he'd met him just yesterday. He'll tell you that he's baldy and bandy and um, he likes, he walks so many miles in his three years. He made it so interesting and so down to earth. Women love that kind of detail that's missing out of the everyday reading. But all of our women would turn up to that, that as I said, like myself, early school leavers, never ever thought you would be interested in anything in the Bible and sat there and were just blown away by the realism, the, the reality that he brought into the word of God was huge. And you came away and you thought, yeah, now I know what we're talking about. I never sit back in the church again and, and blank out and let my mind wander. And um, we loved Kieran, we loved him coming, you know, he told, explained all about the symbolism of the miracles. That explained an awful lot to us. And, you know, what Kieran had was very liberating for all of us. And if you can catch something of what Kieran does or says, he's on Tarsus.ie, he's loads of stuff. He's, he works for uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, ecumenical, the ecumenism in Dublin, isn't it, Seamus? Yeah, the ecumenism. So, he is a huge asset to anywhere and anybody if you can grab hold of something of what he has to give. So let me go on now to our mass, our, our mass, which is so extraordinary that I think if people walked in without knowing, some might stay and some might run a mile because <clears throat> our people were a little bit shy at first when Seamus started doing this. They thought he was going to ask them the hard question, <laughs> but <clears throat> What happens is we have our readings and we have our gospel. And then we'll be asked to share a word or a sentence that resonates with you, what just sticks out in your mind. Um, most of us now would have this book called the Magnificat. I don't know if anybody heard of it. So it has the daily readings for each day. So it gives you a chance to prepare yourself in advance if you want to, and or else it's there in front of you if you want to peep back and say what was said in the gospel. And there is no homily. The homily is people asking a question, making a statement, adding something to the conversation, speaking about a personal experience. And, you know, you see your neighbours, you would never have this conversation with your neighbour on the bus or at the shops, but you see your neighbour there 
and they're coming out with gems of wisdom that you wouldn't say, God, I never thought he thought like that or she thought like that. And, you know, it ends up like a family meal. I'm one of 12 children and it always reminds me of our, our house when we were kids at home because there's banter around the table, there's joking, there's laughter, there's seriousness, there's sadness sometimes. All human life is there. And it touches us so deeply into your heart that, you know, I come away, I, it makes my day. I miss it so much, I really do. We have mass online and that's wonderful that we can continue that way. But it will never for me replace the physical attendance. I know there's a big fear in the church about that. But on the other side of that, the fear, on the other side of the fear is that we are now an evangelical church because we are reaching much more people now than we could ever possibly do in our local churches. So Seamus is going to America every weekend and England and Wales and Scotland. He's everywhere, this man. But um, I would love if Mass for Everybody had even a, a little piece of this. People don't want to be talking about 2000 years ago and biblical language, the language is so awful for down to earth people who don't speak like that, don't think like that. And when you can get it into people's own language and the way they speak, it's so much easier to understand. So I can't say any more than that. I am the luckiest person in the world to live in the parish I live in, with the people I live in, with the people I work with. I love it. I love every minute of it. And to the wonderful sisters, parish sisters, Liz, Maura and Mary, and Melda, they do so much work. They are unsung heroes as well. And to Paddy and to uh, my lovely Paul that speaks Spanish too. Um, we are blessed. So I hope you've enjoyed listening to us. I hope it has opened some new avenues for you. And um, do come and visit us sometimes when we open up again. Now, if you'd like to question, if you'd like to question, <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat>